Hi, and welcome to Jam Yesterday, a culinary tour through literary history. Today, we'll be making cool bouillon from Kate Chopin's The Awakening, using a recipe from Celestine Eustace's 1903 cookbook, Cooking in Old Creole Days. So if anyone hasn't read The Awakening, or you're like me and you haven't read it since high school, um, what it's very, very briefly about is a woman living in late 19th century New Orleans who discovers that she has appetites and desires outside of what would have been considered appropriate or acceptable for a wife and mother in that time. And ultimately, what it's really about is her inability to reconcile these two sides of herself. So throughout the novel, Chopin uses dinners and eatings to sort of punctuate major changes taking place, as well as to highlight what seems to be this irreconcilable duality in Edna's life. So as a woman with feelings and desires of her own, a longing for artistic expression, but one who's also constrained by society's patriarchal structure. So when she's falling in love early in the novel with Robert Lebrun, he serves her a meal of broiled fowl and bread, which he's helped cook for her, um, which is actually a really interesting sort of reversal of typical gender roles. And this reversal may actually be why she's falling in love with him in the first place. Then later, as she's really discovering her dissatisfaction with marriage as an institution, she attends a meal with a happily married couple, and the meal is described as delicious, but she still leaves feeling depressed after spending so much time in the company of a woman who defers to her husband on every point throughout their conversation. So in fact, uh, Chopin uses the word delicious repeatedly throughout the novel. There's a delicious song, delicious crimson fruits, delicious February days, delicious champagne and grapes. Um, so she's sort of alluding to this idea that the awakening Edna's experiencing, it's awaken an awakening of a sensual nature. Uh, it's not just about sex, but it's about food and art and all of the senses. Um, going back to Cobouillon then, um, at the point in the novel where this dish makes an appearance, Edna's attending a dinner party where Robert has announced that he will be leaving that night for Mexico, effectively ending their relationship without actually telling Edna that he's leaving before she hears it in a room full of people. When Edna entered the dining room one evening, a little late, as was her habit, an unusually animated conversation seemed to be going on. Several persons were talking at once, and Victor's voice was predominating, even over that of his mother. As she seated herself and was about to begin to eat her soup, which had been served when she entered the room, several persons informed her simultaneously that Robert was going to Mexico. She laid her spoon down and looked about her, bewildered. He had been with her, reading to her all the morning, and he had never even mentioned such a place as Mexico. She looked across at him, where he sat beside Madame Lebrun, who presided. Edna's face was a blank picture of bewilderment, which she never thought of disguising. He lifted his eyebrows with the pretext of a smile as he returned her glance. He looked embarrassed and uneasy. When is he going? she asked of everybody in general, as if Robert was not there to answer for himself. Tonight, this very evening, did you ever? What possesses him? Were some of the replies she gathered uttered simultaneously in French and English. But when did you make up your mind to all of this? demanded Monsieur Farival. This afternoon, returned Robert with a shade of annoyance. At what time this afternoon? persisted the old gentleman. At four o'clock this afternoon, Monsieur Farival. Robert replied in a high voice and with a lofty air, which reminded Edna of some gentleman on the stage. She had forced herself to eat most of her soup, and now she was picking the flaky bits of cool bouillon with her fork. For anyone who doesn't know what cool bouillon is, and I was definitely in that category before I started researching this topic, uh, cool bouillon is roughly translated a quick cooking soup. So the name comes from the French for court or short and bouillon or broth. So it's a briefly boiled liquid essentially. So we know that some version of cool bouillon has been around since at least the 17th century. Um, it shows up in François Pierre de Lavarin's Le Cuisinier François, um, which was published in 1651. Varenne's version, and most versions that you see in European cookbooks, typically involve some type of fish cooked in a clear liquid, so broth or white wine or vinegar, 
with some aromatics and herbs. So, and it doesn't really cook for a long time the way a uh, traditional soup would. So, however, since the awakening is set in Louisiana, we're going to be making the Creole version of the dish, and I am attempting to use a Creole version of the pronunciation. Um, so the pronunciation I'm using actually comes from a book by Louis Armstrong, which says the word should be pronounced Coubillon, which is what I'm trying to say, but I may not always succeed. And the Creole version of the dish um, adds a roux and tomatoes, and sometimes it also includes peppers, onions, and celery. Um, we're also going to use red snapper because that is a fish that you find in the Gulf of Mexico. So going back then to how you make Coubillon, according to cooking in old Creole days, Make a good brown with a spoonful of lard and a little flour. Add a piece of garlic and half an onion, cut fine. Let them brown well. Add two tablespoons full of well-cooked tomatoes, salt, black coarse pepper, red pepper, two laurel leaves, and a coffee spoonful of saffron. Add enough bouillon to cover your fish and to make a good sauce. Add half a cupful of good white wine. Take two pounds of very fresh, fine fish Take out the bones and cut it up in pieces two to three inches long and wide. Salt well and fry it in a little lard. Add the fried fish to your sauce and let it the whole simmer together for half an hour. Do not turn your fish so you may not break the pieces. Cover your pot halfway as you do for a soup and serve hot. Uh, so with all that said, how do you make cool bouillon and how does it actually taste? So I have here two cups of fish stock, which I just made, and I'm going to link to the recipe to that in the comments on the video. A quarter cup of flour, a quarter cup of vegetable shortening. The recipe called for lard, I could not find lard anywhere, so we're going with vegetable shortening. Half a cup of white wine, two tablespoons of stewed diced tomatoes, um, and a recipe I found from 1916 called for canned tomatoes, so I feel perfectly happy using canned tomatoes and not stewing these myself. Um, a teaspoon of salt, a half teaspoon of cayenne pepper, and a half teaspoon of black pepper, half an onion, uh, one clove of garlic, two bay leaves, and then uh, three uh, red snapper fillets. Um, the recipe calls for two, two pounds. Um, this is closer to one pound, but there's only two of us eating it, so um, it didn't make any sense to me to buy two full pounds of fish. Um, so now that we've got all our ingredients, the first step is to make a roux. So how does one make a roux? First, um, if you're starting with any kind of hard or fat, like uh, shortening or lard, something that's solid at room temperature, first you want to melt that. Uh, then you want to throw in your flour and stir it up until, as my grandmother used to say, the oil takes up the flour. Um, once that's all combined, you want to keep stirring it over a low flame for um, about an hour to an hour and a half. It takes forever to make a roux. It's really unfortunate. Um, so and over this time, your roux will go from sort of a whitish, off-whitish color to tan, to light brown, to dark brown, and finally to a sort of mahogany color. Um, this is what we call a brick roux. Brick roux um, is about as dark as you can get it before it burns. And when I was a kid, um, when I learned to make roux for gumbo, uh, my parents had some mahogany colored cabinets and I always compared the cabinets to what was in my pan. Unfortunately, the cabinets in my current kitchen are not that color. So I'm guessing a little bit here. Um, Sometimes you can kind of turn your flame off when you're a couple uh, degrees before a brick roux and let it coast up and darken a little bit. Um, I decided that I was just going to take it as dark as I wanted and then immediately decant it so it didn't keep cooking and burn while I wasn't watching it. You can do it either way, um, but this is how I decided to do it this time around. So, and once all that's done, we can keep making our soup. So now that our roux is done, our next step is to saute our vegetables in a little bit of butter, and then I'm going to make the soup. So first step first, we wanna peel the onion and the garlic and chop them up, or throw them at ourselves, that's fun too. Smashing garlic, I think, is always fun. Uh, 
Um, and then I'm gonna chop these up. So medium to small dice in both of them. Um, it's soup, so you don't really have to be that careful about it. Um, so one of the things that I find really interesting about The Awakening is that you have the character of Edna, um, grew up in Kentucky as a Presbyterian. Um, she marries a Creole man, moves down to New Orleans and has this awakening of sensuality. Um, she awakens to sex and to art and to food. And I think that if I were eating Creole or Cajun food for the first time um, after whatever they ate in Presbyterian households in Victorian Kentucky, um, I think I'd probably have some sort of awakening too. Um, so another interesting thing I think is the difference between Creole and Cajun food and Creole and Cajun culture. I think they're used interchangeably now and I think that the food definitely has um, sort of started to merge in the last century. Um, but traditionally, Cajun food um, is from the Acadians who were French Canadians. Um, they moved from Canada um, and they mostly lived in the countryside of Louisiana. Um, they were not as wealthy, um, so a lot of their food is very much peasant dish sort of stuff. You don't find a lot of exotic ingredients. Whereas Creole food is very much about the mixture of cultures. So you had um, former slaves, you had African cuisine, you had um, Spanish settlers, you had French settlers, you had all of these different foods combining in New Orleans and all these different cultures combining in New Orleans. So you have much richer uh, cuisine. So this is part of the reason why we know that Colbouillon is actually a Creole dish as opposed to a Cajun dish because it has things like saffron in it, which you don't really find in Cajun food. So this is very much a very, a very rich culture and a very rich dish that we're making here. And now that um, our vegetables are chopped, we're going to throw them in our pot and we're going to saute them a little bit. Then we're going to throw everything else in and make soup. Now that I've gotten my, um, my vegetables diced, I'm going to saute them in a little bit of butter. And while I'm doing that, I'm also going to uh, dredge the fish, which I just chopped into about two to three inch pieces. I'm gonna dredge it in a little bit of flour and I'm also gonna fry that until it's nice and golden. Now that my onions are sauteed, I'm pretty much just gonna dump everything except the fish in and bring it to a boil. And this is gonna be fun. Um, my roux is cooled and it's re-solidified. So I'm gonna to have to try to get it back out of this uh, Pyrex that I threw it in. So normally um, when I make roux or the way that my dad taught me, which is the way that his mother taught him, um, we generally do it with um, vegetable oil. So when it's cool, it's not, solidified like this. It's more of um, kind of an oily paste. Um, in some ways this is easier, in some ways this is harder. And I think my fish are just about ready to flip. I don't want to cook these too much because they are going to cook in the soup. Um, I just kind of want to get a little bit of color on them. And that roux is sort of mixing in there. Right now there's just sort of little brown streaks. Hopefully the once the fat in there totally melts, it'll mix in a little better, better and you'll have a nice dark brown colored soup. But we'll see how it goes.
And I think my first batch of fish is done. And time for batch two. And I think I forgot to dredge that one, but we'll see how it goes. My stock is at a boil, so I'm just going to let it simmer while I do the last of the fish. It is still a little stringy. The um, roux hasn't really mixed in. Hopefully it will before everything is cooked. I'm worried that this is going to be really, really spicy. That was a lot of cayenne pepper for a very small amount of broth. Um, but yeah, I guess we'll find out when we do the taste test. I think my fish is done, so I'm going to turn it off and throw it in the pot. As well as the fish that we fried earlier. And the recipe says to let that simmer for 15 minutes with the lid off and then 15 minutes with the lid on. All right, so we have made co bouillon. And now how does it taste? Um, and today, once again, Matt has come in to help me with the tasting and to offer his opinion since my taste might not be everybody's taste. Matt's taste might not be either, but at least you get two opinions. Um, so let's All see right. how it goes. <clears throat> I'm a little concerned that this fish cooked a really long time. Yeah, it's uh, a little tough. What do you think? Um, it's very saffrony. Trying to make this. The fish is a little tough. And that piece wasn't so bad. And it's pretty tasty. Um, yeah. I mean, it's not it, too spicy. It has a taste, which to me puts it ahead of the white soup that we did last time. Yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> it wasn't terrible. It was just. Or a different palette. It lingered in a bad way. Mm. Um, it's not super fishy. I guess the fish I got must have been fairly decent. Yeah, it's not that fishy. It um, it tastes not that different from like a jambalaya or something like that, but a, just with a gumbo. Yeah. Well, no, it tastes pretty different from a gumbo. Which is I weird think. because this is really similar to a gumbo. It's yeah, not at all similar to a jambalaya. Yeah, maybe that's because I'm used to like shrimp and jambalaya and stuff like that, and mm -hmm. not used. Don't haven't had fish and gumbo in a long time. Yeah, I always make gumbo with chicken and sausage, not fish. So that is because I am allergic to shellfish. So Matt never gets shellfish in the house. And that doesn't mean that we're never going to make a shellfish episode, <laughs> but. Actually, it's getting a little spicier. There's a lingering. There's a lingering heat to it. Yeah, there's a bunch of cayenne pepper in there. There's about a half a teaspoon for like two and a half cups of liquid. But yeah, it's got it's got a good flavor. It's got it's a I mean as you'd expect with a the roux, there's a lot of, a lot of depth of flavor to it. Um, and this actually has like some vegetables and mm -hmm. things in it, unlike the last one. Yeah. Uh, the white soup, which uh, had just white in it, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the fish is a little um, Tough. well cooked. Yeah. But it's not bad. Which it's one good. would expect for it simmering for a full half an hour? Fried and simmered. Fried and simmered, yeah. But so, how does it evoke the period for you? Does this feel like a modern dish? Does this feel like something that you would eat now? 
I, I think because of the toughness of the the heavy spice and the toughness of the fish, it does feel like an older mm -hmm. dish where you just set it and walked away from it for a while. It does feel a little bit like that. And the roux, um, roux always. And granted, people eat gumbo now, but roux always seems old fashioned to me just because it takes so long to yeah. make that you don't make it every day now. It's sort of a special occasion dish. And yeah, I guess the tough fish does seem like it's not quite what our modern palate likes. Um, I think the heavy dependence on saffron seems a little old fashioned to me. Yeah, you don't see that much. I mean, it's expensive. Yeah, it was expensive then. <laughs> I mean, this was a very much a wealthy person's dish at the time. Yeah. So yeah, overall though. Uh, good. Yeah. I'd, I'd eat this. I'd eat it again. Maybe I wouldn't cook the fish as long. Yeah, you could probably put the fish in like halfway through. Yeah. But yeah, so um, we're going to finish up eating and then I'll be back to talk about the scores and how this stacked up against our last dish, white soup. So now that we've eaten Koboyang, how does it stack up against our previous dish, white soup? Um, so at Jam yesterday, we score our dishes on three characteristics. Jam today, or how does it taste? Jam yesterday, or how evocative of the era is it? And then jam tomorrow, or how does it look? So for taste, or jam today, I gave it a 7.5. Matt gave it a 7. I think I liked it a little bit more than he did. Um, we both agreed that it tasted really good. We scored it down a little bit because the fish was very tough. For how evocative of the era was it, um, I gave it an 8 and Matt gave it a 7. Again, it, it really did very much seem like a period dish. Um, Matt said that um, there was nothing green in it and it really did feel like if it had been a modern day dish there would have been green pepper or parsley or something in it, but it was very very brown and very, all of the saffron made it feel very old fashioned. Um, on appearance, I gave it a four and Matt gave it a five. Again, it was very brown. There was no green in it. There wasn't really any attempt to make it colorful. So overall, um, that gives my score a 19.5 out of 30 and Matt's was a 19 out of 30, giving us an average of 19.25 out of 30. Um, that's 1.75 uh, over white soup. So we did like it quite a bit better than white soup, um, but there was still a little room for improvement, uh, particularly in appearance. Um, so that's it, that's Cole Bouillon. Um, thank you all so much for watching. Please, if you're so inclined, feel free to like and subscribe. And thank you again to Matt for being my taster and helping out with setting up the shots. And thank you again to my sister Rebecca for help with costumes. And hopefully we will see you next time on Jam Yesterday.